Well, I have been greatly moved by the worship through music this morning, and uh, that song was just kind of the icing on the cake. I'm excited now to hear the message. I've already heard it once, and I'm still excited to hear it the second time, so you know that there's something there for all of us. It's... Uh, it's not necessarily a rare occasion when you run into someone that just knows how to encourage. It's not necessarily a rare occasion when you run into someone who, who seems to be able to speak peace into your life in just about any situation. It's not necessarily a rare thing when you find someone who is dedicated and sold out to God. It's not necessarily a rare thing when you find someone who, who knows God's Word and who seeks God's will and looks for God's direction in everything that's happening. But it is somewhat rare when you bring all of those qualities together and have them contained in one individual. And I believe that that's exactly what our speaker represents today. I'm not saying he's perfect. I know he's flawed just like the rest of us. But I have been on the beneficial end of him being an, an encouragement. Him being one who speaks truth. Who, who tries to build and tries to develop instead of tearing down. And I am greatly blessed to be able to introduce him to you today. You'll have a chance after the service to get to meet him and his wife Denise. They'll be next door in a fellowship hall. In case you weren't aware, last Sunday the deacons made a recommendation that we call this gentleman to be our, our um, administrative pastor. I was trying to think of the name of it. Administrative pastor here at Mile Strait. Next Sunday we'll be voting on if you have any questions, any comments you need to share. You can see one of our deacons or one of our pastors. We would love to hear what you have to say and provide you with information as you may desire and need. Uh, but uh, before that happens, you'll get an opportunity to hear from his heart, to hear this guy speak. And Greg, we are so honored to have you here today. Please come and share what God has put on your heart. Would you welcome him to the stage, please? <laughs> Well, I would love to be able to live up to those words. I thank you, Tom. It means so much to me uh, coming from you. I am so thankful to be here, Miles Strait. You, you just, you don't know how thankful I am. Uh, God has done some remarkable things, is all I can say, um, some remarkable things that we could be standing here before you today. And I want you to know I have for a, a very long time held this church in the greatest admiration. Uh, I had the privilege, I've been here before, I had the privilege of getting to meet Brother Al and uh, getting to hear him and see his heart. And I know that what is continuing to be built here with uh, Pastor Tom and the team that he has assembled around him, I, I know where the origin lies. Ultimately, of course, it lies in God, but I'm so thankful for the faithful foundation that has been laid here. If you don't have a good foundation, whatever you're building on top of, it's in big trouble. And I'm so thankful this congregation, this church, and this ministry here at Mile Strait is built on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ, and it was laid there by a faithful man and continues to be carried on by faithful men, and I'm so grateful. I want to say thank you to, um, to Pastor Tom, Jason, Mickey, David, Brother Jeff, and the deacons. Uh, such an honor for us to be here, and uh, I, I've got to say, we know some of you already, and uh, from in the past and just to see again uh, how you've not changed a bit now I have but you've not and uh, it's, a, it's a remarkable blessing that we feel from the Lord 
I watched a show recently on ESPN. I don't know if you if you watch anything like that or not, but this was a an interview of some former basketball greats, and they're all sitting around in these chairs, and they're just swapping stories about their playing days. There was uh, Magic Johnson, Kareem was there, Elijah Wan, and then there was this other guy who was up there on the, plat- on the stage with them, and I thought, now, who is that? Because he didn't look very athletic. Uh, he, he didn't look like, I don't know if he'd ever dribbled a basketball, to be honest, but there he is with all of these greats. And I'm thinking, what in the world is going on? Who is that guy? And then it hit me. The only reason he's on the platform is because the producer put him on the show. He didn't have any skills that you could tell. He didn't have the look. But he was there because the producer put him on the program. Now, I don't know why I'm telling you that. Except that maybe some of you are looking up here and saying, what is that guy doing up there? Well, I'm here Only because the producer, as it were, the one who reigns and who rules and Ephesians 1.11 works all things according to the counsel of his will, has put me on the program. And I am so thankful to him for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory. Amen. Amen. Let's look at your mission statement. Wow, what a mission statement. Everyone on mission, magnify, multiply, mobilize. I love that. Two weeks ago, Pastor Tom addressed magnify. Last week, Brother Roy addressed multiply. Today, we come to mobilize, and it's my privilege to be able to share on this for a few minutes. Now, I had to look it up, wanted to make sure I was accurate, and I did. To mobilize means to assemble or marshal into readiness for active service. It means to prepare for action, especially of a vigorous nature, which means, obviously, there's no sitting still when you mobilize, but it's up and at them. It's, it's action. It's exertion, which has to happen if you're going to follow Jesus because he's on a mission. You know what his mission is? He said it. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. And he's included us in his mission, right? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Listen, brothers and sisters, our Savior is going to fulfill his mission. He's going to save the lost. It's his mission. And his missions don't turn out sometimes like ours. His mission doesn't turn out like Benghazi did or Kabul did. No, no. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and they will never perish, for I give them eternal life, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. His mission, and he's going to succeed, is to save the lost, including even the most miserable of men. Which brings me to my text and to my title. I hope you'll open your Bible with me for the next few minutes to Mark chapter 5. We're going to read through verses 1 to 20 and we're going to talk about mobilizing to reach even the most miserable of men. Mark chapter 5 verse 1. Mark 5, 1. 
They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes, or your translation might read Gadarenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs. And no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told in the city and in the country. People came to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man the one who had the legion, sitting there, clothed, and in his right mind. And they were afraid. (coughs) And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with the demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began, I'm sorry. He went away and began to, to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. You're going to have to give me just a minute. I've lost my voice. Do you see it? Our Savior is going to save the lost, He's going to fulfill His mission. He's going to reach even the most miserable of men. And that means we've got to reach them ourselves. I want us to see this in the scriptures now. If I can make it, I hope I can. Beginning with misery embodied in verses 1 to 5. Misery embodied. Here it is, this miserable man 
beyond compare. <clears throat> he's howling. He's crying. He's moaning. He's screaming at the top of his lungs all hours of the day and of the night. He's making his home in the graveyard. <clears throat> He's prowling around naked in the tombs and in the mountains, possessing superhuman strength, able to resist every effort to restrain him, cutting himself with sharp rocks in a twisted quest for relief from his torment. He's howling, as one put it, at the sight of his own blood in a delirium of <clears throat> pain and pleasure. <coughs> and he's doing these things because he's teeming with demons. Can I call a timeout, Tom? Does anybody have a throat drop? <coughs> anybody? Please, anyhow. <clears throat> I'm sorry, last week I was sick. Oh, what have we got? It's a mint. Thank you. That might help me. Now you can see that I'm speaking on spiritual warfare. And to get this open... <laughs> All right, let me just say, I've been doing this for 30 years. I've never had this happen. Oh, thank you, thank you. See, they teach you this in seminary, how to make a good first impression. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, you all. I did this to show you that you're getting a thoroughly human being if you decide to <laughs> stick your head in this noose. All right. Let me see if I can do it. It's starting to come back. <clears throat> this miserable man, if you'll look at verse 9, <clears throat> He answers that his name is a legion, for we are many. A legion was a, was a term for a Roman regiment. It consisted of 5,400 foot soldiers, 120 horsemen. So this means this picture here is of a man who has somehow, we don't know how, but somehow he has been taken over by an entire army of demons. And they fill them to the absolute human maximum of fury and aggression and madness and misery. He is misery embodied. Second, Misery confronted in verses 6 to 13. Notice in verse 6 that seeing from afar the boat coming to the land, this miserable, demon-possessed man ran toward it. Immediately, according to verse 2, no doubt to terrorize and assault whoever was in that boat, because that's what he was used to doing for any unfortunate soul who happened to wander into his territory. But suddenly this miserable man, teeming with these demons, where does he find himself? Flat on the ground. He's confronted with no ordinary man, but with the God-man. The demons begging him through the mouth of this miserable man not to be tormented. Verse 7. It's interesting, isn't it, that the tormentors 
don't want to be tormented. For Jesus was saying to him, verse 8, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. I don't know about you, but I try to use from time to time what I refer to as sanctified imagination. I try to imagine this man, the sights and the sounds of such a miserable human being. And you know, there were people who would have said, that's no human being. That's a wild and vicious animal. We just want rid of him. And then suddenly Jesus coming onto the scene and Jesus doing what only God could do. Delivering the miserable man out of Satan's grasp and setting him gloriously free. Amen. Driving out every last demon that had ever tyrannized this poor man. And sending them away into a large herd of swine, which, verse 13, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The pulpit commentary notes that by this Christ shows of how little worth are earthly possessions when set in the balance with the souls of men. The recovery of this demoniac was worth far more than the value of the 2,000 pigs. Friend, I don't know this morning you may be here and you, you may not look like this man, act like this man at all, but you're miserable. We have a way, don't we, in churches of dressing up and putting on makeup, wearing the nice clothes and masking the misery of our hearts and our souls. If that's you, Look what Jesus did for this miserable man. And if he did that for him, is there not hope for you? Oh, there is. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's misery confronted. Now the last, misery relieved in verses 14 through 20. When the herdsmen, thank you, when the herdsmen witness all this, they, they hightail it out of town with a story like none other. And like bees out of the hive, you know, here come all these curiosity seekers to see what has taken place. And what do they see? They see Jesus with the man who's been so wild and so violent and so furious and uncontrollable and miserable. And now that man is perfectly at ease, perfectly calm. His sense, his reason, his understanding, his dignity have all been fully restored. He's got clothes on. And he's sitting, Luke tells us in his account, at the feet of Jesus with the same attitude of rapt attention that Martha's sister Mary sat. Do you remember that? When she sat at the Lord's feet listening to his teaching. The former wild man, the most miserable of men, now completely composed, sitting at the feet of his deliverer. Hearing the word of him who delivers Satan's wretched slaves and numbers them among his saints and his servants. In the beautiful words of Matthew Henry. The garrison's response, verse 15, they're afraid. And they start begging Jesus to go back where he came from. Shocking, isn't it? <clears throat> They see his power. They do not see his love. They'd rather have the swine than the Savior. 
but not so the miserable man. Now, now that man's not miserable anymore, but relieved of his misery, and it's dawning on him. I was demonized. I was tyrannized. I was tortured. I was humiliated. I was beyond all hope. I was beyond all help. And Jesus came on a mission for me. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. He mobilized. He crossed the sea to reach even me. The most miserable of men. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Please, let me be one of your disciples. Make me your 13th. And Jesus says, no. But go home. And you mobilize. And go on mission for me. And I tell you, I doubt there was ever a more convincing missionary than this guy. Brothers and sisters, Jesus' mission is to save the lost. He's going to do it. And his will is that we be involved in that. He's given us his word on it, hasn't he? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. That's his word. So we're mobilizing to reach even the most miserable of men. Because Jesus will save them. Right, Mr. Garrison Demoniac? One time I uh, stopped at a mobile home when I was a pastor in Alabama, out in the country. And I'd drive by this mobile home and had no idea who lived in it. It was not a well-kept place at all. Lots of stuff around outside. And <clears throat> the Lord seemed to keep saying to me, you know, you're the pastor of the local church. You're going to have to stop and invite these folks to church to see if you can witness to them. I managed to keep driving past that place because it just, I don't know, I just, I, I guess I was a little intimidated. Finally, I... I stopped one day. I walked up to the door. The main door was open. There was just the the screen door there on the trailer. I knocked on the door, and there was a man's voice from inside. It yelled, it's open. I didn't know if that was an invitation or a statement of fact, you know. So I opened the door, and I stopped stuck my head in and this was probably a 12 maybe a 14 foot wide trailer and there was a full size pool table in the living room I mean it took up the whole thing and he's standing there and he's got a pool stick in his hand and he's looking at me and I'm looking at him and I said my name is Greg Lindsay I'm the pastor at Hughes Memorial Baptist Church. And he stopped like this. He held that out. I thought, is he going to hit me with it? Or what's he about to, what's, and he goes, we'll talk about it. So he kept holding it out. I thought, well, he's telling me to take it. Turns out this man, his name was Hal. Hal had a hearing loss since he was a child. He had a speech impediment because of the hearing loss. He had a lazy eye. And I learned later he had suffered all kinds of abuse as a child because of those problems. And you know how cruel kids can be. So he finally, we talked a few minutes and he said, I'll tell you what. 
If you can beat me in a game of pool, I'll come to your church. Now, I'm not a pool player. I don't even know how you're supposed to, what you're supposed to do with it on this end, you know, with a stick exactly. All I can say is the Lord must have sent an angel to play pool through me because I beat him. It was a miracle. And Hal started coming to church. And he began to sit under the sound of the gospel and listen. And here comes his wife. And here come his two little children. And this family comes under the sound of the gospel and they're listening to the word of God. And God begins to move in their lives. After eight years there, God called me to another place and I lost track of how. I understood later, I heard that he had gotten cancer really badly. That's the last I know of how. I just tell you that story because it's the kind of thing that if we mobilize to go on mission with Jesus, that's the kind of thing that's going to happen. And we want it to happen. Because that's us. We were lost. Somebody came to us with the gospel. Mile straight, let's go. Let's do this. Everyone on mission. Magnify, multiply, mobilize. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the privilege of standing before your people. I pray, Lord, that through my mess up here, they could still hear something that might be of benefit to encourage them in their walk to think of the person that they might know who's the most miserable no one would give a chance no one would think God would ever want them help us to see that's the person that most needs the gospel and Jesus is willing to save help us go to them Lord, I pray you'd richly bless this congregation in the days ahead. And I pray that a mobilization to your glory and praise will happen. In Jesus' name, amen.